Alrighty, here we go. Back to it. Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes and illustrated by Lind Ward. We are now in chapter two. The pride of your power. What a great picture. Clearly Johnny at the workbench. Okay, Dusty in the background at the furnace and Dove in the foreground, probably holding a basket of charcoal. The week wore on each day as hot as the one before, for it was July. Every day after dinner, Mr. Lapham took a long nap under his basket, snoring as gently as he did everything else. Johnny would let him sleep for an hour, then wake him up, scold him, and get him to work. His work was beautiful. The body of the sugar basin was quickly completed, and he began repoussing it on it, the rich garlands of fruit, with the same skill he had had 40 years before. Johnny's own work did not satisfy him as well. He had exactly enlarged the handle in his wax model. Mrs. Lapham and the girls, even Mr. Lapham, said it was fine, and he could go ahead and cast it in silver. It was only Johnny himself who was dissatisfied. Friday evening, when the light was failing and work over, Johnny took the silver pitcher and his own wax model and left the shop. He was in Fish Street, in a minute stopping outside the silver shop of Paul Revere. Now just take a minute and remember, in your so social studies, studies that we've talked about, Paul, this is the time of Paul Revere and the Sons of Liberty, and they are um, really active in Boston. Paul Revere is a very, very famous silversmith, so everybody knew who he was. So even though this is realistic fiction, it's realistic. Like, this is real. Paul Revere is a silversmith, and you could go to his shop. He didn't dare knock, but he knew that at any moment now the silversmith would be closing his shop, leaving for his dwelling in nearby North Square. He was so prosperous a smith that he did not live and work in the same place, like the Laphams, okay? So at last he saw Mr. Revere, a stocky, ruddy man with fine, dark eyes, shutting his shop, taking out his key, preparing to lock up. Good evening, Mr. Revere. The man smiled with a quick flash of white teeth. He had a quick smile and a quick face and body. And that kind of goes with our other stories. And then what happened, Paul Revere, or just the biography of Paul Revere? He's always moving. He's always doing something. He's quite involved and very busy. Good evening, Johnny Tremaine. The boy had long admired Mr. Revere as the best craftsman in Boston. He had no idea Mr. Revere knew his name. He did not know all the master silversmiths had an eye on him. Mr. Revere, I'd like to talk with you. Man to man, Mr. Revere agreed, opening his shop door and motioning Johnny to follow him. Johnny's eyes flew about the shop, taking in the fine anvils, the hood upon the annealing furnace, the neat nests of crucibles. It was just such a shop he would himself have when he was man-grown, not much like Mr. Lapham's. Although Paul Revere was as busy a man as there was in all Boston, he took everything so easily in his stride, doing the one thing after another, that he never seemed rushed, so now because an apprentice stopped him on the street and said he wanted to talk to him, he appeared to have all the time in the world. Sir, said Johnny, it's a matter of handles. He took the silver pitcher out of the cloth he had wrapped it in and his own wax model and explained Mr. Hancock's order. So you want to talk to me as a silversmith to silversmith, do you? He had Johnny's wax model in his hands, delicate hands, to go with such heavy wrists. What does your master say of your work? Mr. Lapham won't even look at it much, but he says it's good enough and I can go ahead and cast tomorrow. I've got to cast tomorrow because it's Saturday and we can't work Sunday and it must be done Monday at seven. Although my master thinks it's all right, I'm not sure. He is wrong and you are right. Look, You've just copied the handle on the pitcher too slavishly, just enlarged it, 
Don't you see that your winged woman looks coarse in comparison? I'd have the figures the same size on both pieces. Fill in with a scroll. Then, too, your curve is wrong. The basin is so much bigger. You cannot use the same curve. Yours looks hunched up and awkward. It's all a matter of proportion. He took up a piece of paper and a pencil and drew off what he meant with one sure sweep of his hand. I'd use a curve more like that, see? This is what I meant when I said I'd add a scroll or two below the figure of the winged woman, not just enlarge her so she looks like a Boston fishwife in comparison to the angel on the picture. See? I see. The man looked at him a little curiously. There was a time, he said, when your own master could have shown you that. Mr. Lapham is, well, he's feeble. Not doing very much work these days. Not what you'd call much, Johnny felt on the defensive. Not much fine hollow wear, plenty of buckles, spoons, and such. How many boys? Three of us, sir. I'd hardly think he'd need three. Now, if he wants to cut down, you tell him from me that I'll buy your unexpired time. I think between us, we could make some fine things, you and I. <gasps> the boy flushed. What a compliment, right? The boy flushed to think the great Paul Revere wanted him. Tell your master, I'll pay a bit more than is usual for you. Don't let him shunt one of those other boys off on me. He stood up. It was time for Johnny to go. <sighs> I couldn't leave the Laphams, sir, he said as he thanked Mr. Revere. If it wasn't for me, nothing would ever get done. They'd just about starve. Hmm. I see. You're right, of course. But if the old gentleman dies or you ever want a new master, remember my offer. So, and he turned to shake hands. May we meet again. That's the end of section one, but since we're only seven minutes in, I'm going to continue with section two. By Saturday noon, Johnny, following Mr. Revere's advice and his curve, had got the model of the handle exactly right. He could tell with his eyes closed. It felt perfect. He rapidly made a duplicate, for when the molten silver was poured in on the wax, it would melt and float away. So he made a model for each handle. Now, no matter how long it took him, and if all went well, it should not be too long, he must get his handles cast, cleaned, and soldered to the basin itself, which Mr. Lapham had made. Of course, on Sunday, the shop would be locked up all day, the furnace cold. Mr. Lapham would, as always, escort his household, dressed in Sunday best, to the Cockerell Church, and after that, back for a cold dinner. With, and remember, people, Sunday is the day of rest. You are not allowed to work, so you don't even cook. You just eat the food that has been previously prepared on Saturday so that you can fully rest. Whether they went again or not to afternoon meeting, the master left for each to decide. He himself always went. Madge and Dorcas usually entertained their beau. That, that would mean like if a gentleman caller was coming for uh, dating purposes. Mrs. Lapham slept. Scylla would take Isana out along the little beach. Johnny, Dove, and Dusty were apt to steal off for a swim, although Mr. Lapham had no idea of it because even playing is not really accepted. He thought they sat quietly at home and that Johnny read the Bible out loud to them. So, Sunday was out. But if he got up at three or four Monday morning, he would have time to clean his work before he took it over to Mr. Hancock at seven. After Saturday dinner, Mr. Lapham, as usual, prepared for a snooze, stretched out in the one armchair in the shop with his basket over his head to keep off the flies. Perhaps Johnny's tyranny during the week had irritated the old gentleman, who never believed it made the least difference to anyone when anything was finished. Dove, Dusty, Johnny was yelling. Build up the furnace. Fetch in charcoal. Kai, you lazy good-for-nothing dish mops. 
Dove ran out to the coal house. There was a queer, pleased look on his face when he returned. Charcoal all gone, Master Johnny. Gone? Yep, I haven't said anything because you always like to take charge of things like that round here. <gasps> Get a basket, quick. Run to Mr. Hamblin over on Long Wharf. Try Mrs. Hitchborn down on Hitchborn's Wharf. You've got to get charcoal. Hurry. Dove did not hurry. It was getting on toward sunset when at last he came back, pushing his big basket on a wheelbarrow. It was the worst-looking charcoal Johnny had ever seen. Oh, this isn't what we silversmiths use. This is a fourth-rate stuff, fit for iron, maybe. You know that, Dove. No, not me. I don't know anything. See, you're always telling me. I want willow charcoal. You never said so. I'll go myself, but this delay means we'll be working in lamplight and up to midnight. Uh, you are the stupidest animal God ever made. If he made you, which I doubt why your mother didn't drown you when you were a pup, I can't imagine. Come Lord's Day, and I have a spare moment, I'm going to give you such a hiding for your infernal low-down skulking tricks, you'll be... <gasps> oh dear, and isn't that rude? And again, we don't speak to each other like this. This is just the author showing how angry Johnny is at Dove. The basket over Mr. Lapham's head moved. He laid it down. Boys, he said mildly, you quarrel all the time. Johnny, in angry mouthfuls, told him what he thought about Dove and the charcoal and threw in a cutting remark about Dusty. The old master said, Dove, I want to speak to Johnny alone. And then, Johnny, I don't want you to be always riding them boys so hard. Dove tries, but he's stupid. Ain't his fault, is it? If God had wanted him bright, he would have made him that way. We're all poor worms. You're getting above yourself. Like I tried to point out to you, God is going to send you a dire punishment for your pride. <sighs> yes, sir. One trouble with you is you haven't been up against any boys as good as yourself, or better, maybe because you're the best young one in this shop or on Hancock's Wharf. You think you're the best one in the world. Johnny was so anxious to be on with the work, tediously delayed by Dove's tricks, he hardly listened. And boy, don't you go get all fretted up over what's, after all, nothing but an order for silver. It's sinful to let yourself go so over mundane things. Now... I want you to sit quietly and memorize them verses I had you read about pride. Work's over for the day. What? Yep, it always was the old-fashioned way to start Lord's Day at sunset on Saturday, and I've decided to reestablish the habit in my house. Mr. Lapham, we've got to work this evening. We've promised Mr. Hancock. I doubt God cares even a little bit whether Mr. Hancock has any silver. It's better to break faith with him, isn't it, than with the Lord. Johnny was tired. His head was ringing. His hands shook a little. He walked out of the shop, slamming the door after him, and stormed into the kitchen. He knew Mrs. Lapham did not take much stock in her father-in-law's pious ways. Remember, godly ways. She and all four girls were in the kitchen. Madge was frying cornmeal, Dorcas wringing out a cheesecloth, Scylla was setting the table, and Isana playing with the cat. Mrs. Lapham looked at him. Boy, have you seen a ghost? Johnny sat and told his story. He was beyond his customary abusive eloquence. That means, like, he's usually, you know, uh, not saying things nicely. <laughs> And beyond it means he's really mad and he's saying things very rudely. The girls stared at him with piteous open mouths. Mrs. Lapham's jaw set grimly. 
Dorcas, shut that door. Don't let your grandpa hear. Johnny, how many more work hours will you need? Seven. Maybe I can get two Monday morning. You shall have them. Sabbath or no Sabbath, that sugar basin is going to be done on time. I'm not letting any old-fashioned, fussy notions upset the best order we've had for ten years. And if Mr. Hancock is pleased, he may come again and again. I can't have my poor fatherless girl starve just to please Grandpa. Listen now to me. Sunday afternoon, Mr. Lapham was not only going to the second service as usual, but there was to be a meeting of the deacons, a cold supper afterward, and a prayer service at the pastor's. <gasps> That's where you get them five hours, Johnny, tomorrow afternoon. Well, Johnny knew that working on the Sabbath was against the law as well as against all his religious training. He might very well go to the stocks or to hell for it, but when Mrs. Lapham said, Darest to, Johnny? He said, I darest. It's like she's saying, do you dare to do it? And he says, yes. Not a word to the old gentleman, mind. Not a word. Girls, if you so much as peep, oh no, ma. Dove and Dusty were to be bribed into service by the promise of delivering the basin to Mr. Hancock when done. He, was all, he always gave money to boys who brought things to the house. Mrs. Lapham was breathing hard, but she had the matter well in hand. It was settled. Isana, she said quietly, you call Grandpa and the boys in to supper. Scylla, run down cellar and fetch cold ale. Her mouth and the folds about it, even her nose and eyes, were like iron. That's the end of section two in chapter two. Be sure and subscribe so you can get updates when I have new videos, math, and I'm going to try to get through this book. It's such a good one. See you on the next video.